Theology 101 seeks to share information and insight into the various topics of the Catholic faith, which deal with God, the Church, the sacraments, and other issues. Your program host is Father Jim Corda. Hello and welcome to our show, Theology 101. I'm Father Jim Corda. Today we're going to talk about the Bible and tradition. And joining me in today's show is Father Pat Manning. Welcome to our show. Thank you very much. And uh, before we begin, I really need to say congratulations on 40 years of ordination. And thank you. Many blessings. Okay. Thank you very much. And thank you for uh, your work, not only at Walsh, but also teaching our seminarians. Uh, Sister Mary McCormick uh, was on our show, and she also is very instrumental in forming our young men. So thank mm -hmm. you both uh, for the work you do. It's an honor. When we talk about the Bible, you know, ma many Catholics or many Christians have a sense that the Bible, uh, as we have it sitting on our end table or coffee table, is the way it always was. Mm -hmm. That's not true. No, it's not Let's true. talk about uh, the Bible and how it came into existence and why it's so important for us and, you know, what, what really transpired this written Word of God. Well, actually, the subject of the Bible is incredibly interesting. And unfortunately, I would suggest that uh, some Christians really have it wrong and that they treat the Bible as if the Bible is the only way that God speaks to us. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that, well, there are a number of problems with that, but probably the most fundamental problem is this, is that the church existed long before the Bible. The, the Bible is uh, the product of the church. You know, St. Paul was preaching Jesus. He was uh, um, founding communities in various places in Asia Minor. Uh, in, in, he was uh, in, in the Holy Land. And he would put people in charge, and then he would send them letters. And all of these, and then the stories, the four Gospels, um, that came at different times. But all of those uh, uh, were put together later. The church, the police, people of God, you know, the body of Christ existed. And so uh, a lot of people try to narrow how God works. You know, it's not that, well, God put um, you know, the Bible together and then left. That's the only way he speaks to us. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to understand that we need both uh, scripture mm -hmm. and we need tradition. Uh, the Bible is a beautiful book. Uh, and it's obviously the word of God. It's incumbent upon every Christian. But one of the uh, problems is, is that it's not always easy to interpret. Mm -hmm. And uh, if everybody is equal in terms of interpreting, well then there's no authority. If there's no authority, well there can be an awful lot of misunderstanding. So if I could pull a passage, for example, from the St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 5, verse 21, 22. If you take it out of context, it says, wives be submissive to your husbands. Well, there's a lot of ways that that can be interpreted. Well, the first problem is to take it out of context. You know, you have to look at the whole chapter and the whole letter, and it says just uh, in, in a very similar way that husbands have to be love their wives. So, um, the, and the, some people would interpret that as well. Okay, you know, that means women are subservient to men, which of course is certainly not our belief and certainly not God's intention. And so, if someone says, "Well, listen, I have my opinion, you have your opinion," well, that's fine. But the problem is, is that that's not uh, going to give us what the Lord intended by giving us the scripture. So we need an authority. There's no, um, really, there, there, there's no valid interpretation of the Bible without some kind of authority. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, the function of the church. And that's why um, people like yourself and myself and others have been sent away for many, many years to study the scriptures so that we could help people understand. Uh, another good example, if you don't mind me just rambling a bit, would be the book of the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely powerful, beautiful book, but a lot of people have used that book to uh, intimidate people when, in fact, the whole scripture, the whole vision of John was to give people hope, right. especially those who were being martyred. Let's uh, talk about that word tradition. Uh, and is it only for us as Catholic Christians who believe in the tradition of the church? Uh, or uh, is tradition really rooted in who we are as Christians in general? Well, I think it's really important that the word is absolutely important. Uh, and it's also important whether you have an uppercase T or a lowercase T. Now, I'm sure that your Italian family has some wonderful traditions. Mm -hmm. Good for you. You know, and we even have a few of our own in our, in our Irish tradition. But those would all be lowercase T. The uppercase T is the tradition 
that was given to us founded on the apostles that's centered in the church. Now, it's interesting if we pay, pay close attention to the scriptures, and a lot of people don't notice this, but, you know, the word uh, tradition comes from the Latin tradere, which means to hand over or to hand on. So if you betray somebody, you hand them over. So that's where the word tradition comes from. Now, if you pay close attention, especially to St. Paul, you're going to find, for example, in St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15, mm -hmm. St. Paul says, I hand on to you, traderay, I my tradition, I hand on to you what I myself received. And it's handed on to us so that we can hand it on. Mm -hmm. St. Paul says that again in chapter 11 of the letter to the Corinthians, when he talks about the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's the reading that we have on Holy Thursday. Mm -hmm. And he says, I hand on to you what I myself received that on the night before he died, the Lord Jesus. And so we have this idea of tradition. Mm -hmm. And the tradition, of course, is founded on the apostles when Jesus uh, uh, gathered them at the Last Supper, uh, instituted the priesthood, and, uh, if, uh, and also appeared and said, whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven. There's a power within the church that isn't found in individuals. Let's talk about the sacred writer. You know, we know that it's just not one person that wrote the entire Bible. There's many sacred authors. Uh, what is the role of the sacred author and um, who are those people? Well, that's a really, really great question. Uh, we, of course, we have all of the, the scriptures in the Old Testament, and scriptures in the New Testament. Uh, one of the traditions of some of our Jewish brothers and sisters are that uh, Moses wrote the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, also called the Torah and the Law. But scripture scholars tell us it's absolutely impossible that that could have happened because it covered so much time. So what's important is, is that we understand that the scriptures are inspired mm -hmm. and sometimes the pseudonyms were used. Uh, and sometimes uh, so to give them a little bit more, more credit. So, for example, the Gospel of John, mm -hmm. there's a good chance that John's disciples are the ones who put the, mm -hmm. um, the, the Gospel of John together, just to give one example. Mm -hmm. And let me build on that example of uh, the Gospel of John. Uh, Ray Brown, uh, God, God rest his soul, a Sulpician priest, who was absolutely brilliant, uh, he said that the Gospel of John was put together in, in five stages. So um, it was added to, and, and, and the community um, put, put these together so that it had a more complete story. So if you look at, I think it's John 1330, Jesus says, let's get up, it's time to go, and it continues. Mm -hmm. And then in chapter 20, it says, uh, all of these things have been written so that you might believe. It's just as if it's an ending, and then it continues. Right. Or if you would go to the Gospel of John chapter 8, the first 11 verses mm -hmm. is the story of the adulterous woman. It's pretty clear that the Greek is much different than it is in the other parts of the gospel, and that was added into that. But it's all, of course, uh, the Word of God, and it, so it, it's incumbent upon all of us. So just like, um, you know, uh, if, if, if you or I wanted to, to um, put a, together a book, what we might do is we might get a number of people to do articles, mm -hmm. and then we'd have a compilation, so we'd have a, a nice mm -hmm. different view. And so there were probably a number of people who added to... Now, these are the Gospels. St. Paul wrote all of St. Paul's letters. Mm -hmm. um, and so it depends on which uh, scripture you're studying, mm -hmm. which, uh, which book of the Bible. Let's also talk about a time frame. Uh, the Bible obviously was written over many centuries, many years. Uh, is there a time frame that we could put the books of the Bible within? Does that make sense? Well, there's a, there's a time frame. Um, some of the books are able to be dated fairly accurately. Others, not so much. You know, the book of Genesis is the first book of the Bible, but it's very clear that it wasn't the first one written. It's the first book of the Bible because it contains the two creation stories in chapter 1 and chapter 2. Uh, but the, the scriptures um, were... Uh, first, Hebrew scriptures were, were written probably 1,500 years before mm -hmm. Jesus, all part of our, 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 our tradition. But if we study them and study the contents, and with references to names and places, mm -hmm. there's a, a, an ability for scripture scholars, of which I'm not one, but scripture scholars to be able to get a good sense of um, when, when these were written. If you want a, a very clear example, if we could look at the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel mm -hmm. was written about 165 years before Jesus. But it refers to Nebuchadnezzar, and it refers to the, the persecution of the Jews. Mm -hmm. And so it's pretty clear we're able to say with people's names in it, 
just about when it was written. Mm -hmm. Now, if we go to the New Testament, it's pretty clear that the Gospel of Mark was the first Gospel written. It's probably written about the year 64, 65. And it was written for Gentiles. It was mm -hmm. written for Gentiles in Rome. So we're going to see when we have these four books of the Bible, uh, four Gospels, I should say, that they're going to be all stories of Jesus, but they're going to have different um, uh, concerns and, and because they wrote to different audiences at different times in different places with different needs. So as I mentioned, the Gospel of Mark was the first written. It was written for Gentiles. Mm -hmm. In other words, those who are not Jews trying to convert to Christianity. Uh, so it has very few, understandably, very few passages from the Old Testament because the Gentiles wouldn't know. But if you go to Matthew, mm -hmm. clearly Matthew has all sorts of uh, references to the Old Testament because Matthew is writing for Jews. Mm -hmm. If you go to Luke, you can tell by Luke's language that he wrote in Greece and his kind of thinking and his, his, his logic kind mm -hmm. of fits the, the way it would make sense to a Greek audience who would have a, a philosophical background being aware of Plato and Aristotle. And then John is written in such a way that it's much more um, uh, for, for all Christians, it, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's a much wider appeal. So you can, you can find these things when you spend time studying them. We've got about uh, two or three minutes left of our first segment. Let's talk also about the language of the Bible. Um, there was probably written in different languages. Uh, what does language have to do uh, with the Bible? Obviously for us here in the United States, we read it in the English, but it wasn't the original language. So sure. talk about language in the Bible. Well, of course, that's a great question. And language is very, very important. Now, the, the, the Hebrew scriptures, uh, the Jewish scriptures were written both in Hebrew and then later when the Roman Empire embraced Greek, mm -hmm. there are a number of books, seven books in particular, that we accept on our Catholic Bible that are not accepted mm -hmm. in the Protestant Bible. And they're not accepted because they were written in Greek even though they're, they're Hebrew books. So the first piece is, is that uh, if we're going to understand the scriptures, we have to go back and look at the original languages. Mm -hmm. Okay, in the New Testament, almost the complete New Testament was written in, in Greek. Um, and and uh, the only, for example, there's every once in a while you find a Hebrew word like Abba mm -hmm. or something like mm -hmm. that, but it's, it's, it's written in Greek. And of course, uh, the reason it's important to study these languages is that if you look at the word love, there are three or four different words for love in Greek. We only have one in English. So you'll hear, I love pizza, I love football, I love beer, I love God, I love my grandma. Whereas the word eros in Greek means a physical kind of love. Philia means kind of a brotherly love. And the word agape is a complete self-giving, self-sacrificial love, the kind that Jesus modern, um, uh, modeled for us on the cross. And so what appears in the, in, in the Greek text makes a big difference in terms of how we're to understand what uh, the passage is trying to share. We're going to talk a little bit more about some of that in a little more detail, but we're going to need to take a quick break. So please stay with us. We'll be right back. The Society of St. Paul announces a new book called Saints of the USA by Brother Marco Bucarelli. This book for children ages six and up will fascinate young readers as they learn more about the saints of North America. Those who read it will meet 10 figures who have lived lives of holiness, as well as the Immaculate Conception of Mary, patroness of the United States. The book can be found at St. Paul's Books and Gifts at 926 Boardman Poland Road on Route 224. The store is open Monday through Saturday from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. or call 330-953 2443 or email at St. Paul's Bookstore at gmail.com and learn more about these saints of our time. My name is Sister Mary Claudina and I run a home for abandoned children. I want to take care of children who have no parents because luckily I come from a very loving family. There are, there are eight of us. We learn to care for each other, to love each other, to fight among each other, just to be a family. And I think that's what I, um, I learned from home and I wanted to, to share that with children who do not have that opportunity. 33 million Americans have descended into poverty. And as their futures fall, so does our nation's. 
Welcome back to our show. I'm talking with Father Pat Manning about the Bible and tradition. You know, prior to the break, you had mentioned those seven books that were written in Greek that are part of the Old Testament that we as Catholics look upon as inspired word of God. Talk about those, and there's another name or another distinction that Protestants use uh, to determine those seven books. Right, of course, um, we consider them part of the, the scriptures, even though they're written in Greek, mm -hmm. uh, whereas uh, Protestant brothers and sisters would consider them deuterocanonical, which means deutero is a Greek word which means second, mm -hmm. or in this sense it would mean after, after the Bible, so that the books do exist and they do have some kinds of uh, some references, but for our Protestant brothers and sisters, they would not be accepted. That's why the, there's a difference in the Protestant and the Catholic uh, Bibles. Mm -hmm. You know, interestingly enough, we have the very same thing in the, uh, in, the, in the New Testament. And that is, is that we have our, um, our, our scriptures that are already in the canon, and the canon sealed, it's not going to be added to or taken from. But there's also other books that were written at the time when the church was trying to put the canon together mm -hmm. that, um, uh, that are considered um, apocryphal books. For example, there's the Gospel of uh, um, Thomas, or there's a proto-evangelium of James. So uh, this brings us back to, this is where tradition uh, mm -hmm. and the scriptures are so very important in terms of tied together. You see, because uh, uh, um, Father Corder, the way this works is, is that sure we have the Bible, but it didn't come from nowhere, it came from somewhere. Mm -hmm. Now, I've already said that it came from the church, but the other thing is, is that it didn't just show up. The Bible was formed over a long period mm -hmm. of time. And so it was probably the first part of the third century when the Bible was finally put together. So in other words, it wasn't the, the, the apostles, obviously, there wasn't a Bible, didn't mm -hmm. follow the, the, the Bible. They certainly you know, knew the stories and they were writing the stories and they were listening to St. Paul. But the Bible was put together over a, 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 a period. And, and so who is supposed to put this together? Well, obviously, there's a tradition. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the tradition is found in the church. Now, uh, this is going to be really important uh, when we have a chance to talk about um, the Vatican II and, and the Verbum and the doc document on divine revelation. Because as Catholics, we believe that the Lord speaks to us in two primary ways, mm -hmm. outside of the fact that he speaks to every one of us in terms of our own spirituality. And that is uh, in uh, scripture and in tradition. And so there are a number of things that we believe in, in our Catholic tradition that are not necessarily found in Scripture. Mm -hmm. Now, were these inventions or are they developments? Mm -hmm. And uh, the one who probably did the greatest work in terms of understanding and expressing these things is John Henry Newman, who wrote an essay on the development of doctrine. Mm -hmm. So what he is saying is, is that at the death of the last apostle, there was no new revelation, mm -hmm. but it wasn't yet completely articulated. So that later on, we believe, um, we, 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 we said um, uh, in, in the mid-1800s, uh, the document of the Immaculate Conception. But we believe mm -hmm. in their hearts, the apostles already believed that and knew that. In other words, the church doesn't know anything now that the apostles didn't know, but it takes a while to, to, to clarify it. Mm -hmm. If I could just do one other example, you know, we have the scriptures and we have four wonderful stories about Jesus, four gospels, mm -hmm. You know, but none of them ever say Jesus is fully human and fully divine. So who decides exactly what is the nature of this Jesus? Is, is, he, is, he, is he just a man? Well, if he's a man, we've got a problem because he didn't rise from the dead. And if he's, if he's God, well, that's going to be a problem too because we already have a God, you know, the God Yahweh. And so it took a tradition, it took a church, it took a community in, a, in, in, in the form of a council. To, so this is, this is the important bridge between tradition and scripture. And of course, uh, we could spend uh, a lot of time talking about the ecumenical councils of the church and how uh, each of these councils uh, talked about specific aspects of the church and defined different doctrines of the faith. But this is uh, a different series right now. Let's talk about that word as you were talking about tradition, uh, magisterium. That word mm -hmm. came up, uh, and oftentimes we hear that. What exactly does that word mean, and what uh, does it tell us? Sure, magisterium uh, is a word that comes from the Latin magister, which means teacher. Mm 
-hmm. And uh, one of the roles of the, uh, um, the church and one of the roles of the leaders of the church is to teach. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, and so, um, in other words, God would have never given us, and this is one of our firm beliefs, God would have never given us a revelation, which he has, mm -hmm. about himself in Jesus if he didn't instill within the church this infallibility, this promise not to have us stray about mm -hmm. things that refer to God. And so the magisterium, uh, uh, the ones who um, discern the official teaching mm -hmm. of the church so that the flock will be led in the right way. We know we've had readings in the last couple Sundays about the Good Shepherd. There was one about the Good Shepherd today and, and Jesus being the gate. And um, if we're left to our own, as I mentioned at, at the very beginning, if everybody can interpret the Bible in any way they want, then everyone is a scripture scholar. The problem is not everyone's right. And so we need some kind of organ, some kind of institution within the church that, that teaches the truth and discerns the truth and is able to interpret the truth for the uh, uh, people of God. Let's uh, carry that a, a little step further and talk about that whole sense of interpreting the Bible. Uh, when we were first ordained 40, 41 years ago, uh, there was a sense of uh, a fundamentalism that really was um, uh, very uh, big, not only uh, in, in Christianity, but I think it was pretty rampant. And so the Bible especially was fodder for that, that they interpreted the Bible literally. And this is exactly what God was trying to tell us uh, through this particular verse or this passage. Uh, why is it important for us when we study the Bible or read the Bible that we have that uh, proper interpretation? And how do we come to that? That is a, a wonderful question. And I think where we need to start is our, our belief about inspiration. Okay, inspiration because it comes from obviously in spirit to us, in the, in, in the spirit. And that, that the scriptures are the word of God. Mm -hmm. God is the author and humans are the writers. And God used, he inspired human writers. Now, um, a, a good example, it, it's important to understand when we're talking about inspiration, we're talking about the Holy Spirit moving someone to do something on God's part. Now, at some point you were inspired to go to the seminary. But that doesn't mean God came down and knocked on your door and said, you know, James, you and I need to talk. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's something else that happened. You know, you were inspired some way. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so too, those who wrote the scriptures are inspired. And so they wrote down what God wanted them to write down about himself. Um, but notice that, he, that God used human beings. This is, the great, this is the great revelation about Christianity, that God became human, that God became one of us. And God chose to use human beings who are imperfect, um, such as you and me, to write the scriptures and continue to teach about the scriptures. And so if we're going to use human language, right from the very beginning, human language was and still is, probably now more than ever, symbolic. Mm -hmm. In other words, none of us speaks every day absolutely literally. Right. You know, if I said, geez, you know, I, 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 I don't know what kind of car you have, but I'd say your car is cool. Mm -hmm. Well, if, if it's cool, it's been out in the snow, you know, so, so it, means, it, it means something different. Mm -hmm. So the only way to really understand, because we use human uh, language, so, uh, we have to go back and look at what that, those words meant at the time of Jesus. So we have, for example, Jesus says, let the dead bury the dead. Well, that's not a bad trick if you can do it. But obviously, Jesus wasn't telling the dead to bury the dead. Another passage would come from the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, paralleled with the, um, Luke 6 and the Sermon on the Plain. And Jesus says something to the effect of, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Well, if we take that literally, well, we're going to have a lot of people who have one eye until they mistake again, then they're going to lose the other eye. And obviously that's not what the Lord meant. So the Lord did mean something. And so that's why we need to study. That's why we need an authority. That's why we need... Hermeneutics is what the science is called of understanding and interpreting the Bible correctly. And let's um, kind of talk about that word hermeneutics uh, in the last few minutes of our time together. Sure. Uh, it's important. It's interestingly enough, interesting enough, I think that as human beings, we forget how important hermeneutics really is. And, that, and here's basically how I like to look at it. You know, we know what somebody says, 
But now the question is, what does he mean? So here's a, here's a perfect example. It has nothing to do with the scriptures. Okay, but you, you know, let's say your best friend's married. Okay, and he says, I got to talk to you. My wife's mad at me. How do I know? Well, I told her I was going to be home late. And she said, fine. Now, we know what she said. She said, fine. But what did she mean? And maybe she meant not so fine. Mm -hmm. So it has to be interpreted. It's very, very com <clears throat> complex. So even in human gestures, human gestures, somebody can sit there like this and, you know, be defiant mm -hmm. and, in fact, really just be tired. But um, when I was teaching at Mount Union, I had a lot of athletes who would sit in the back of the, back of the, uh, the, the room and kind of do their lean and I would always say to them, you know, gentlemen, where you're sitting and how you're sitting is telling me far more than you ever want me to know. So hermeneutics is basically, it's a whole human dynamic that we can do with our own words, our own gestures, modern language. And, and, and so the writers of the Bible, because they were human, they used the same, same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 you know, let the dead bury the dead or let, you know, pluck out your eye. Well, obviously Jesus is saying this is very important. But if you take it literally, well, then it's self-destructive, which obviously has nothing to do with the uh, goodness of God. Uh, we have two minutes left of our time together. When we as Catholics read the Bible, uh, should we read it uh, with certain things in our mind or certain understanding, or is it okay just to pick up the Bible and to read it? Oh, I think, first of all, any time anyone spends with the Bible, I think is already a blessed time, and I think it's really very, very good. But it's also important to go to the Eucharist every Sunday. You know, there's people there, like you and me, who were, uh, people spend a lot of money on us, and we spend a lot of time mm. preparing to do this. So it's really important to always do it in the context of, of, of the church. Mm -hmm. I just gave um, a series at a parish down in Canton uh, on the Gospel of John. You know, mm -hmm. that, that we should keep our eyes out for, for um, uh, situations like that where we can learn more. Uh, if we try to understand the Bible and never refer back to the community, we're eventually going to be led astray. We're going to be stepping out of the tradition and out of the proper understanding. Because if, if, we, if, if we don't, we can let the Bible mean anything we want it to mean. Again, you know, one of the points, too, I think, you know, as we close, is that you know, people say, well, you know, even the devil can use the Bible. Well, the devil does. He does. He tempts Jesus, and he's quoting scripture. Mm -hmm. That's why it's so important to take scripture and its understanding so very seriously in the context of community. Well, Father Pet Manning, thank you so much for enlightening us about the Bible and tradition. And we encourage the folks that are with us to learn more about the Bible at their own uh, parish community and to read the Bible as God's inspired word. Thank you. Good. And thank you for being with us. Have a good day and God be with you. Theology 101 was a production of CTNY, the Catholic television network of Youngstown. Your program host was Father Jim Corda.